My name is Graham Walker, and I'm coming to you from Oakland, California, uh, where I am with the Independent Institute. We are a think tank and research and publishing company uh, that uh, tries to get an independent point of view out there in the educated public. And of course, we are here in the shadow of San Francisco uh, in California. We are going to be talking about the COVID crisis and some of the public policy implications of the crisis. And um, I'm really happy to welcome uh, as my uh, partner in this conversation, Dr. Randall Holcomb. Uh, welcome, Professor Holcomb. Thank you, Graham. It's good to be with you. So glad you're with us. Uh, you are in Florida today, right? I'm in Tallahassee, <laughs> Florida. I'm an economics professor at Florida State University. And last time I checked, you not only were a professor, but you're the holder of an endowed share in economics there at Florida State. Uh, yeah, my official title is Deville Moore Professor of Economics. That's pretty impressive. I think also you have credentials that are relevant for this discussion, and also because you were the president of the Public Choice Society, which is a very influential group of economists. Uh, is that current or is that in the past? Uh, that's in the past. That was uh, <clears throat> now more than 10 years ago. Yeah, the Public Choice Society is a group of ex-economists and political scientists who use economic methods to analyze political decision making. So and we, think, we need some of that because there's a bunch of political decision making that's going on without any attention paid to the economic ramifications. So we're glad that you're here. Also, uh, are, may I call you Randall? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So, so also, Randall, you are the author um, of this book, Liberty in Peril, Democracy and Power in American History, published by uh, us here at the Independent Institute, which is an incredibly uh, interesting historical uh, analysis of the ways in which there have been tensions in American political history between uh, the pursuit of democratic majority will on the one hand and the protection of individual liberties on the other hand. The two haven't always gone hand in hand, have they? No, they haven't. No, they haven't. So that's why uh, we are grateful to have Randall Holcomb with us today. So let's get into our subject a, a little bit more. Let me frame it this way. Um, it seems that uh, uh, you know we're we're grateful for the input that epidemiologists are making during this current crisis. They have knowledge that nobody else has, and that you know we need in this crisis. Um, the epidemiologists, um, however, are trained in epidemiology. They aren't trained necessarily in the interconnections between public health, the health of the economy, and uh, the health of people. Um, those connections between public health and economic health is not their forte. Um, and so if, as sometimes I suspect, economic shutdown is endangering public health uh, because of the uh, fallout uh, on people's lives economically, epidemiologists aren't the ones who are trained to understand that. Econ economists understand that better, although they aren't epidemiologists. And so we're all kind of groping for understanding here. Um, and I'm thinking that you, Randall, can shed a little light on these things precisely because you're not an epidemiologist. So, um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I think so. You know, we, we all need one another's expertise. It's not just one thing here. So you published a piece with us um, on uh, our Beacon blog, uh, which is at www.independent.org. Everybody's free to go there. Um, uh, you are... Uh, a piece is called Government Restrictions Have Gone Too Far. So can you tell us a little bit about what you meant in that piece by saying that government restrictions have gone too far? Sure. Uh, I start that out with an example. So let me run through this example and we can think about it a little bit. But um, one of the things when this crisis uh, uh, started really appearing, we had all these government mandates. And one of the mandates was that hospitals are not allowed to provide to perform non-essential mm -hmm. medical procedures. Right. Uh, and there was some logic behind that. The idea was we want to save those hospital beds for the droves of COVID-19 <clears throat> patients we expect to, to see coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it turned out, fortunately, uh, the forecasts uh, didn't turn out to be as uh, as bad as, as originally forecast. Fewer, we had fewer cases, fewer hospitalizations. Except for in a few localized areas where it was overloaded, but most yeah. of the time, it wasn't. Yeah, uh, through most of the country, there's mm -hmm. excess uh, hospital capacity, uh, and the 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 prohibition on non-essential procedures left a lot of hospitals with a lot of empty hospital beds. 
Uh, and one of the results of that, this is especially true for rural hospitals, had a lot of hospital beds. Financially, these rural hospitals are shaky anyway, because they weren't getting the revenue from the non-essential procedures. They're actually laying off personnel. They're laying off hospital personnel during the middle of a pandemic. So, they have empty hospital beds, and a lot of them are threatened with bankruptcy. That's so, incredible. I mean, especially because the idea of elective or non-essential procedures, my understanding is that that covers a lot of stuff that is really important. It's just not like immediately life-threatening. So I know people who have put off their cancer treatments because non-essential ele so-called elective procedures were put on ice. We're not talking about, you know, uh, having your fingernails fixed or your, your plastic surgery here, are we? No, and I mean, it's a, a lot of routine stuff like colonoscopies, mammograms, right. knee replacements, you know, that, that sort of thing. I mean, but the point is, as it turned out, these hospitals had excess capacity. They could be doing those things. They could be bringing in the revenue, but they were prohibited by the government. And especially for financially shaky hospitals, a lot of rural hospitals, they ended up laying off personnel, they had empty hospital beds, and they were prohibited from doing these non-essential procedures to, to fill the beds. I mean, not right. only to fill the beds for their benefit, but for the benefit of the people who are putting off the procedures. So right. what we have here, we, we have a policy, a well-intended policy that was designed to try to help the healthcare system. And what it ended up doing actually was hurting the healthcare it system. It weakened the healthcare system, yeah. Exactly, Man. exactly. Well, but you know, I guess uh, an ordinary person could say, well, what's a government bureaucrat supposed to do? You have to make a decision to control everybody and you can't always get that control decision right, but you have to make the total control decision, don't you? Well, you and I know that's not a good argument. <laughs> that that, uh, that a better, in hindsight, I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty. so I don't want to be too hard on people who made those decisions. But in hindsight, we can see that the better policy would have been to make a recommendation rather than a mandate. Mm -hmm. that for, the, for the government to say, we recommend that you suspend non-essential procedures, but leave it up to the individual hospitals. Right. So then when the hospitals turn out they have excess capacity, they can have people in for those non-essential uh, procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it is with the mandate, I mean, now, so now we see in hindsight, it, it was counterproductive. It's hurting the hospitals. It's not helping them. So we see that in hindsight, but the problem is hospitals are, have the prohibition. So instead of saying, oh, we have excess capacity, we can go ahead and do those mm -hmm. procedures now, they have to wait for government permission. Yeah, the, the issue wasn't um, whether it was or wasn't wise to hold off on some non-essential procedures. That's not the point you're making. The point is whether it was wise for governmental bodies to coercively mandate that policy and let exactly. it stay until they choose to lift it. That's where the problem comes in, right? Exactly, exactly. Now, are there other um, kinds of mandates to, w to which this kind of um, you know, analysis may apply? Oh yeah, I mean, we're familiar with all of these government mandates that have, that have been handed down. So I live in Florida, so I'm more familiar with what's going on in Florida, but um, uh, at the beginning of April, uh, Governor DeSantis here in Florida mandated <laughs> restaurants shut down, they could do takeout service, but no, yeah. no, no dining. Barbershops, uh, uh, beauty uh, uh, salons, dentist offices, all these things were mandated to be shut down. Uh, and in hindsight, I mean, if we, if we take the same lesson that we get from the non-essential procedures in hospitals, a better policy probably would have been to recommend, to recommend right. that people right. not go to the dentist unless you need to, to recommend people not go out to eat, but leave it up to them. You know, just as a thought experiment, what if a month ago, a month and a half ago, that had been the message um, with all the epidemiology information and so forth, um, I think that people would have stayed away from the dentist in droves, even though it wouldn't have been required by law. Oh, sure. I mean, a lot of people are scared, and rightfully so. If people uh, are smart, they're not stupid. They don't want to get sick. <laughs> Sure, sure. But um, in uh, looking at another policy, you go over to Sweden, and in Sweden, they've recommended that people social distance, they recommend that people be, be cautious, they recommend people wear face masks, but there are no mandates. So in Sweden, 
Children are still going to school. Restaurants are still open. Uh, they don't have the prohibitions. They have the recommendations. And then it's up to individuals to decide. And what they decide, of course, they'll, they'll decide on, on their own, you know, recognizance and best information that they have. Um, it seems like that's a pretty good policy. So when restaurants are allowed to reopen, um, it seems like the restaurant owners and the restaurant customers will all agree on the whole um, that they want to keep one another safe because the customers want to stay safe and the restaurant owners want their reopening to be successful. There's a kind of a built-in incentive for caution, is there not, if people have the freedom to decide? Sure, and, and, and here in Florida, restaurants were allowed to open uh, earlier this week. Uh, now there, there's a mandate that they have open with limited capacity, but restaurants are allowed to open uh, this week. Uh, what we've seen is, first of all, a lot of restaurants haven't opened. Some of them have opened, uh, some of them haven't opened, and a lot of people are avoiding restaurants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe wisely so, but it's, it's your choice as to whether you want to go to a restaurant or not. Uh, and sure, people are scared of the virus uh, the, and people who are the most cautious, maybe people who are the most at risk, they don't have to go to, I mean, just because you're not prohibited from going to a restaurant doesn't mean mm -hmm. you're required to go to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Everybody can make their own choices. Um, and I, while you know, we're talking... While we're talking, right. Randall, um, it's interesting, while we're talking, of course, we've got our ThinkSpot audience with us. Um, thanks, everybody, for being with us. It's kind of fun to have you here. And, and I'm getting a stream of interesting comments while we're talking. I'll just pause for a second just to note a couple of them. Uh, somebody whose moniker is individual rights is saying, local responsibility. What a concept. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. Um, here's another one. This is a little more uh, inflammatory comment here from Miquel Miguel Delgadillo, who says abortions are not elective, but vasectomies are. Uh, so uh, you know, there's some interesting, interesting uh, tinderbox. I guess we don't need to touch right there, but he's making a good point. Uh, let me just toss something else your way, Randall. Um, on this question of individual, you know, latitude to make a decision about whether to go to a store or not go to a store. Uh, whether to open up your hospital or not open up your hospital to elective procedures and so forth. <clears throat> um, okay, so <clears throat> company decides that they're going to open up again, uh, either because they get the freedom of choice back from the government or because the government didn't take it away in the first place, whichever it is, they decide they're going to open up again. At that point, the employees of the business um, really don't have the freedom, do they, to decide whether or not they feel safe enough to go back to work. Um, don't they lose their freedom of choice once the government mandates are lifted? Well, that would depend on the business. I mean, you know, in some cases, um, well, for example, well, let's take healthcare workers, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, they're essentially mandated to go to work. Uh, right. I mean, then they have been throughout the crisis. Right. Of course, uh, that's, that's par for the course in medical work. You know you're going to be exposed to disease. That's what you sign up for. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. But uh, I mean, now that we've seen, uh, and I, again, I'm thinking more about Florida because that's where I live. But now that we've seen the prohibition on restaurants uh, uh, lifted, so now restaurants can open. A lot of restaurants didn't open. And the restaurants that did, well, they're mandated to be at limited capacity. So, I mean, what that's going to mean is employers are not going to want to have all their employees back, right? If you're operating at limited capacity, you don't want to have a full staff when customers are staying away. So that right. would right. allow some latitude right. for, for the workers, you know, that uh, employers can say, we're reopening. We don't need a full staff. Do you want to come back? If so, I'll put some hours in for you. If you want to wait, we're not going to be opening. We're not going to be running at 100% capacity anyway. So, you know, people would have some latitude. But ultimately, I mean, in a free country, don't we want to make that the choice of the individual rather than the choice of the government? Mm -hmm. And one thing I've seen here in Florida, Governor DeSantis has been 
criticized a lot because he hasn't been as draconian as right. governors in other states. Right. And in a sense, the way I'm viewing it is people are criticizing the governor because he's not sufficiently totalitarian. Mm -hmm. We want a more totalitarian government, people. Are well, saying. you're being a little inflammatory with the word totalitarian, but I get it. I get it. Yeah, he, he's, some are criticizing him, some are praising him. Uh, I guess we'll see how it works out. But, you know, even aside from how it works out, there's an underlying principle here, which is, has to do with the kind of the moral character of the prerogative of individual choice, right? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. So it's not, it's not really clear what the best policy would be. And we'll probably never know what the best policy would be, right? right? I mean, we know what we've done. We can see the results, but we'll never be able to see if we'd done something differently, what would have happened. But, but one possible source of comparison there, again, let's look over to Sweden. You know, they didn't shut things down. Uh, they're not doing, they're about in the middle of the pack. I mean, some countries are doing better as far as the, the spread of the disease, some countries worse. They're about in the middle of the pack. So we can compare the more draconian approaches of some countries to the more right. mm -hmm. uh, open policies in Sweden. And it, in hindsight, it doesn't look like those open policies were bad policies. Right, yeah. And, you know, moreover, going back to the case of um, employers who require their employees to come back to work and the employees may not feel ready, of course, probably there is going to be some of that that will occur as we reopen. But at the same time, it seems to me that, uh, especially in our era, most businesses and most employers, um, they're attentive to their workforce. They want their workforce to be satisfied, secure, and healthy. And I think it's gonna be actually, in most cases, proved to be in the interest of employers to give their employees some latitude rather than just saying, everybody has to be 100% back in, whether you feel safe or not. If they take that policy, they're probably gonna hamstring their own success, and they don't wanna do that. So it may be a self-correcting problem. Well, we can hope that's true. But I mean, ultimately, I think we're wise to err on the side of liberty. Uh, that let individuals make their own choices. Uh, let them decide what's best for them. Uh, you know, some people are saying, no, we ought to have these stay at home mandates remain in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you think you're better off staying at home, stay at home. Nobody's right, exactly. forcing you to go out, right? right? And so anybody who thinks they're safer staying at home, you don't have to force everybody to stay home. You just stay home. You can have your groceries delivered, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, sh uh, shelter at home as long as you want. And in a free country, let people take the risks that they think are, are prudent risks. I mean, we let people ride motorcycles without helmets. We let people go skydiving. Um, those strike me as, as risky. Uh, I'm, yeah. not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. But nevertheless, in a free country, you, I mean, you're not free if the only freedom you have is to do what government tells you. Right. Well, one of the things that you bring to this debate, Randall, uh, that I find interesting, and it goes back to your book, Liberty and Peril, um, is that uh, we're hearing a lot about the trade-off necessary between health on the one hand and economic uh, you know, prosperity on the other hand. Um, we've been discussing that. And, and of course, uh, one thing that emerges from your analysis is that the, the trade-off between health and economic prosperity is not so simple because some degree of economic prosperity is necessary for healthcare. So that one's a bit of a false dichotomy, but you actually have introduced a different kind of a question, the trade-off between public health and public liberty. Um, is the trade-off between health and liberty uh, an important way of framing this problem? Yeah, I think it is, especially when you, when you look into the future. I mean, what we've seen happen throughout history, uh, and that great uh, book by Robert Higgs, published by the Independent Institute, um, Crisis and Leviathan, Higgs documents uh, this ratchet effect where you have a crisis, yes, great book, you have a crisis, government responds to the crisis, government's expenditures ratchet up, government regulation ratchets up, and after the crisis passes, it doesn't go back down to where it was before. Right. So we get permanently more government intrusion uh, in our lives. Uh, and Higgs's book, which is a wonderful historical book, uh, he has a lot of evidence from World War I, World War II, from the Great Depression, 
But let's think more recently. I mean, you go back to 9-11 and we end up getting the TSA. Yeah. Uh, right uh, i mean more uh, more government surveillance more government restrictions <laughs> and i guess we're you know talking about the virus i don't want to digress too much into the tsa yeah but the, but the point is there's some comparable lot. comparable dynamics right sure now, i mean the tsa has been seizing people's property uh civil asset forfeiture at tsa checkpoints and and, and things uh so again i don't know that we want to get too far down that but i'll just say there's been a big compromise in our liberty as a result of the, of the TSA and the aftermath of 9-11. And you look at the the recession in 2008, mm -hmm. and we end up getting Dodd-Frank and other, uh, other restrictions, especially in financial markets. Uh, the government ratchets up, doesn't ratchet back down to where it was before. And again, not to get too much into Dodd-Frank, but uh, I mean, one of the things it was passed in response to was that too big to fail idea with banks. Right. One of the results of Dodd-Frank has been greater concentration in banking. More banks are now too big to fail. Okay, so I mean, the point is, we, we put these restrictions in place, they end up being counterproductive, and they end up being compromises in liberty. So what we really need to be careful of in this crisis is, you know, people are saying, uh, you've tried to back me down on this, but the people are saying, Government is insufficiently totalitarian, but what happens after the crisis passes is uh, all of these draconian measures, they don't go away. So we end up having more government intrusion in our lives. We end up having less freedom as a result of the policies that are passed in response to the crisis. Yeah, I think we, we got one question from uh, one of our ThinkSpot friends uh, earlier. I think it came in before we started today. I'm just taking a peek at it. but. Uh, the argument being, um, if these things are just temporary, what's so bad about them? And I think your answer to that is the ratchet, right? Yeah, they're not temporary. What happens is government, government power, government regulation, government spending ratchets up. And after the crisis passes, it doesn't go back down to where it was before. We've seen this time and time again. Right. And again, <laughs> I would recommend uh, Higgs's book, Crisis right. and Leviathan. Just a, a, a great read on that. If we hadn't seen it time and time again, you know, there might be reason to be a, a little more, you know, sanguine or Pollyanna-ish by saying, oh, well, it's only temporary. And, you know, the fact that their government bureaucrats are going to get more control, they'll relinquish it readily thereafter, not to worry. But in fact, uh, we've seen the pattern repeatedly. Um, it goes on and on. And, you know, sometimes, the rhetoric that accompanies a crisis has to do with warfare. You know, it's, well, sometimes literally war and governments have increased their power in war. You mentioned after 9-11, we could go back to World War II, World War I, uh, and Cold War generally. Um, but not only that, uh, the rhetoric of war has been added to um, other matters. Uh, for example, uh, the war on poverty, the war on crime, the war on drugs. Every time there's a war, it seems like if you're in a war, then you got to give some government guy more power, right? That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, I mean, especially people ought to see the war on drugs has done so much to compromise our liberty as far as, just as far as the government surveillance, as far as civil asset forfeiture. Right. It's kind uh, of stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a few other questions that I want to make sure I get to you. Um, uh, we had... Um, some, obviously some creative people uh, were, were getting ready for this and thinking about it. Uh, the public is satisfied with bread and circuses. Isn't it too late to change things? So, I mean, I, I guess that's a reasonable question. We're sitting here having this conversation. If we think that these tendencies are inexorable and that the undertow of control and regulation cannot be resisted, why are we talking? But I think it's because we don't think they're inexorable. Isn't that true, Randall? I'm hoping that's true. Um, as a lifelong educator, my hope is that uh, powerful presentation of good ideas can change people's minds. Uh, I mean, one, one place, I'm going way back in history here, but uh, you look at the Enlightenment ideas back in the 1600s and 1700s, yes. mm -hmm. and it just brought a, a huge change to the world that laid the foundation for the Industrial Revolution. 
Um, so that's, yeah, okay, that's an example that goes back a couple hundred years. Uh, let's go back a few decades. You look at the Reagan revolution, the Thatcher revolution in the 1980s. People change their ideas. They change their views on government. They change their views on what the, the latitude the government ought to have. And, and I'm hoping that, that that'll continue. I mean, back in the 1990s, I was so optimistic because the ideas of Reagan and Thatcher had won out. The Soviet Union had broken up. Uh, you know, and, and communism was on the run. Communism was on the run. Free markets, democratic governments that was being advocated. So I was pretty, pretty optimistic. A and those ideas have been pushed back in the 21st century, you know, so, so I'd like to see us return to those ideas, the ideas of the Enlightenment, the ideas of Reagan, the ideas of Thatcher. So no, I don't think it's inevitable. And the, the Bread and Circus's um, <laughs> comment is an interesting comment because uh, a lot of people say that's what, what led to the decline of the Roman Empire. So is that what we want, the, the, the decline of the, the American Empire? Um, well, let's just say that some people are trying to divert themselves with Netflix. Others are tuning in on ThinkSpot, independent.org, and Facebook, listening to Randall Holcomb and Graham Walker. Maybe that's some hope right there. Yeah. Uh, one of our, our Facebook friends has just sent a little note in here uh, who's watching someone named Anna. Uh, Anna is suggesting that uh, they're just trying to see if we will allow it. That is to say, if we will tolerate the restrictions. You know, she might or might not be right. I'm not sure I want to buy into necessarily that idea. But, you know, Anna and others who may be thinking that even if there were kind of ill will, like, let's see how far we can get away with expanding our powers, um, it doesn't really matter because what really matters is that there's a dynamic involved in this process, which even those who don't intend it can inadvertently fall prey to. And I think that's what we can address. Um, usually we get more traction on these things by assuming good intentions on the part of those we disagree with, but instead just discovering how the things that they intend don't work out because they're, they're engaging in some dynamics that they can't fully control. And that seems to be the case, I think, with these economic restrictions. Yeah, and, and you look at the division of opinion. I mean, it's really interesting because, um, you know, as I suggested before, you know, some people are complaining government is insufficiently totalitarian. We need more restrictions and so yeah. forth. But at the same time, in a lot of state capitals, you're seeing people protesting against the restrictions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, you're seeing people, uh, so, you know, say, set us free. Uh, and and even there was a President Trump had some tweet a few weeks ago, I guess, what it was, liberate Minnesota, yes, and know, Michigan, liberate right. Virginia, whatever. Mm -hmm. But um so it's just, just a kind of a quip, but I was happy to see him use the terminology there, you know, the terminology of freedom. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see that division of opinion. Uh, and, I, you know, one of the things I would like to see is a push more toward people thinking, hey, my freedom is being compromised, mm -hmm. rather than thinking the nanny state is not taking sufficient care of me. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we really need to wean American citizens from the habits, the, the reflex of thinking that whenever there's a challenge of any kind, that the solution must be the government's got to do something about it. Because when the government does something about it, the government gains power and there are lots of unintended consequences. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's scary, the huge expenditure um, bills that are being passed here to, uh, in response to the virus. Um, and, I, you know, I think, you know, people sort of have the idea in the back of their heads that we can throw money at this and try to prop up the economy. But ultimately, you know, money is just a token. You, you buy things with money. Right. But if the economy shut down, you can't buy anything, right? Uh, so it, it's not the money that we need. It's the jobs that we need. We need people to go back to work. We need people to be producing. That's where we get our economic prosperity, not from throwing money around. So we need to think seriously. I mean, I recognize there's a public health threat here, but we need to think seriously about getting people back to work, about getting the economy back to being productive. Um, you know, okay, maybe there's a risk there, but again, I'll look across the ocean to Sweden and see a lot less draconian policies, and they don't seem to have results that, that are, are 
uh, worse. Uh, and I'll say the same thing here in the United States. Again, my own governor DeSantis has been criticized for being, uh, you know, too lenient on the on the restrictions. But mm -hmm. Florida's not doing worse than other states. Um, so, here's, let me, here's an angle that's coming from one of our commenters here. Uh, this one just came in. Uh, somebody commented here. Um, uh, this is uh, Miguel again. For some people, freedom is a, freedom is a burden. He says. Um, and someone else wrote in beforehand that many collective ideologies seem to teach that personal responsibility is a vice. Um, there's something to this analysis, isn't there, that people feel that freedom is a burden, they would be, ha some people are happy to relinquish it. The converse here um, seems to be that when um, we have a society where there is individual liberty to a great degree under the rule of law and people are largely free to figure out what sort of choices they want to make for themselves and their families, it kind of reinforces the sense that human beings have dignity and worth and agency and are able to actually operate in the world uh, and are not simply a pawns of one force or another. To cultivate that sense of human agency um, is actually to renew human nature uh, in a way that's healthy. Uh, and so for some people that feels like a threat because it feels more comfortable just to be beholden and subject, doesn't it? Well, maybe. I mean, uh, uh, sort of two different takes uh, on that. Uh, one is typically if I ask people, do you want to make your own life choices for yourself or do you want someone else to make them for you? Oh, I want to make them for myself. That's what most people yeah, say. Right. But another answer is you look at the consequences of all that government intervention of the nanny state. Where would you rather be right now? In the United States, which is relatively free, or Venezuela? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you look at the Cold War division. I mean, uh, you know, where was the better place to be? The, so the old Soviet Union or the United States? Uh, which so which way was the Berlin Wall facing? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, there are consequences to that idea. You know, people are saying, oh, we want the government to take care of us. And yeah, I think a lot of people have that attitude. Um, and you look at the consequences of that attitude and it's not good for anybody. And, you know, and so again, you know, as an educator myself, lifelong educator, you at the Independent Institute, I mean, these are the kind of ideas that we need to try to get across to people. We need people to think critically. Right. If I turn my life over to the state, what kind of a life is that going to be? Um, I'm going to jump back to the question of protest, uh, and then we're going to probably wrap this up in a few minutes. But um, as to the matter of protest, <clears throat> certainly there have been a lot of protests. Um, some of the protesters don't really help their own cause, it seems to me. I mean, I look at some of the news footage and I see these people who are crowding together, you know, shouting at one another and other people probably coughing on one another. I mean, that's, that seems to be kind of hostile and irresponsible and not to mention discourteous. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there were some protesters in Michigan, I understand uh, last week or a week and a half ago, who are concerned about the restrictions on uh, gun sales in the state of Michigan. They practice social distancing, they were in their cars. Um, it was a very responsible protest. Mm -hmm. uh, citizens can't protest responsibly. Also, um, actually just day before yesterday, uh, we posted on our website, uh, our Catalyst website, which is catalyst.independent.org, a very interesting piece, which was discussing the resistance and protest being made, not simply by private individual citizens, but by persons who are in elective office at lower levels in various states. Uh, you might say constitutional officers at lower levels who are in a position in the constitutional system to um, resist and protest some of these things in a very interesting and responsible way. Is it okay for lower government officials to contest the decisions of higher government officials? Oh, I think they should. I mean, <laughs> really, you, you look across the country in this pandemic and you know, the negative consequences have been really uneven. Uh, and so that's a, a good argument for taking things to the state level, taking things to the local level. Let localities make their own policies. Let states make their own policies. So, I've, I mean, I've seen stuff critical of President Trump saying, uh, you know, he, he's leaving it up to the states rather than having a strong federal policy. Well, he should leave it up to the states. Every state is different. <coughs> And I would go further than that 
And again, here I'll praise my own governor DeSantis. He's left a lot of discretion to local governments. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, things are in South Florida, there's been a lot of cases. Uh, in the panhandle where I am, there's been relatively few cases. Situation is different. Let's have local policies for local differences. We don't need to shut down the whole economy because there are a lot of cases in New York City. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially because when we shut down the whole economy, we ultimately end up undermining people's health, which is the very thing that we say we value most. Uh, you got to see this from the whole range of perspectives, not just from the narrow expertise of epidemiologists, valuable as that is, we have to be able to look at all of the, the interconnections um, of our society, both public and private, and see that um, the best policy is never going to be one where somebody at the center claims omniscience because there is no omniscience. Instead, the best policy will very typically be to allow uh, decisions to be made at lower levels freely by individuals, families, companies, communities, et cetera. And I think that's kind of the burden of your work. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, you just, you look at the results, you know, there, there's such a difference across communities. Let individuals decide. Uh, the news media, the government, they've, they've scared people sufficiently about this that people are aware, you know, this is dangerous, this is a problem. Uh, let individuals decide how they want to respond to it. Some people will be lower at risk, some people are more at risk. The people who feel like they're more at risk, those people can choose to shelter. Um, other people, I mean, you know, think about somebody's lost his job. So right. you're thinking about about public health implications. Well, <laughs> one implication is you could you could catch COVID nineteen. Another implication is instead of e eating your fruits and vegetables, you're eating ramen noodles because you've lost your job. Yeah, uh, and so your health deteriorates. Yeah, exactly. Well. Your health deteriorates there. And, and also there are the mental health consequences. Right. So you have suicide rates going up and right. and so forth. I and have read that, that for every in, uh, one percent increase in unemployment rate, the suicide rate also goes up in a measurable and predictable degree. And so, uh, you know, we're not just talking about economics versus health. We're talking about health versus health. We're trying to make, make the right trade-offs. And I think your point is that most of those decisions do not need to be made governmentally. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, uh, as I say, that the government scared people. The news media has scared people. People are aware there's a danger out there. Let them decide what they think the best response is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to be winding this down. Um, let me just go back to what I think is probably maybe in some ways the most important point we made. Um, even though uh, we can look historically through your book, Liberty and Peril, and others like uh, Robert Higgs, even though we can see that there are tendencies and patterns uh, for the accretion of government power through crises, it doesn't mean that we're trapped and that there's a kind of a doom over us, especially in this current crisis. I think a lot of people around the country, including here in California, are recognizing the ways in which government restrictions actually weakened our response to uh, the coronavirus epidemic. And there are a lot of ways in which even here in California, there's a recognition that lifting mandates is a better way of responding. For example, Governor Newsom here in California, a few weeks ago, uh, decided to lift the restrictions on medical practice for uh, licensed, recently retired medical practitioners, uh, lift restrictions on cross state line uh, medical workers uh, and uh, a number of others in that category uh, because those restrictions done in the name of the public good were harming the public good. So lift them. Also here in California, there is a growing recognition that the legislation passed last fall, which you as an economist in Florida have probably heard about Randall, uh, Assembly Bill 5, which limits what independent contractors, musicians, writers, Uber drivers, and so forth, it, it makes them all, to protect them, it limits their hours and forces employers uh, either to get rid of them or to make them employees. And so as a result, employers are not hiring them because they can't afford to. So we have all sorts of out of work musicians, writers, creative people, uh, and uh, drivers and delivery people are all recognizing that this restriction on freedom of labor done for the sake of labor supposedly is actually harming people, people who need ways to make money while they're locked down at home, but the state of California won't let them because 
you know, yeah. they're trying to protect them by these restrictions. The, all these restrictions, they often have a downside that nobody recognizes. Let's get that straight. And when people see that, they start thinking, oh, yeah, it's not what I thought. And when that thought starts occurring to people, then they start, you know, thinking differently. They're not just in the herd anymore. They can, they can actually make choices at the ballot box that will be different and that could actually reverse some of these trends, at least in, in the immediate crisis. That's what I'm hopeful for. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I, I don't want to be too hard in second guessing decisions that people made a month ago, two months yeah, ago. They we're doing their best. Uh, but let's look ahead. You know, let's say, given what we know now, what's the best policy that we should follow now? And there's a lot of evidence that the best thing to do is to open up, to give people freedom, to allow people to make their own choices. The people who want to shelter at home, let's let them do that. People who want to get out, people who want their jobs back, people who want to get an income, let's let them do that. Also, I encourage you, those of you who are tuning in with us here from ThinkSpot, um, hey, thanks, ThinkSpot. Also, those who are live, watching our live stream on uh, Facebook and on our own website, uh, maybe seeing the recording afterwards, I do encourage everybody to take advantage of the resources that are being assembled here at the Independent Institute. You can always go to independent.org, our website, and if you look kind of at the top left area, there's a COVID information center. All of our material related to this crisis uh, is posted there, some on health, some on economy, society, and so forth. Uh, we are giving you the resources necessary to try and reorient people's thinking in the right direction. Uh, this material uh, with uh, Professor Randall Holcomb will be made available on our website also. Um, in addition, I encourage you to read his book, Liberty in Peril. Um, we are trying to educate the public because we believe in people. People can make a difference, especially when they're careful thinkers and they have good information. So toward that end, let me just thank Professor Randall Holcomb for giving us good information. Yeah, thanks for having me, Graham. It's been fun. It's a real pleasure. And I wish everybody uh, safety, health, and thank you for hanging in here with the Independent Institute. Please visit our website. We'd be delighted to have you uh, support us as well as read our materials. Take care. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.